The chief whip wiped a few drops of sweat from his brow as the Prime Minister took a seat and got straight to the point. What's the state of uh, tonight's vote? You know, the London devolution thingy proposed by the Foreign Secretary. Oh, it's a non-starter, sir, obviously. The chief whip adjusted his trousers as he regained calm. No one on any side of the house has even suggested voting in the eyes. Oh, so there's nothing to worry about? Not in the slightest, Prime Minister. And the uh, Foreign Secretary himself? Nowhere to be found, sir. At wager he's already turning tail and fled in lieu of the disintegration of his career. Oh, well, that's excellent then, isn't it? The Prime Minister heaved a sigh of relief. Excellent indeed, Prime Minister. The Chief Whip stood and rubbed his hands. Uh, perhaps this is a good time to adjourn for the drinks and canapes. Drinks and canapes? Yes, nice way to wind down for the weekend, don't you think? Particularly as we have to stay late anyway for this meaningless vote. I assumed that was why you were here. And uh, who is organising this opportune festivity? Why, the, uh, the, uh, well, I do believe it's the, uh, the, the, the foreign, uh, the foreign secretary. The Prime Minister dropped the sigh of relief he had heaved seconds earlier and crushed it underfoot. Checking his pocket watch for any other reason than to tell the time, a pristinely suited man stood amongst the pigeons and tourists of Trafalgar Square, wondering who was feeding who. Certainly, there was one species taking less notice of the other. A pigeon wandered towards him, pecking at the prospect of some crumbs around his feet. The pigeon stopped when its eyes met the black toe of the unpolished shoe. It stared into the pigeon abyss, and when the pigeon abyss stared back, in an instant it flew away, never to return. The shoe walked on. Roll up, roll up, find the lady amongst the knaves! The foreign secretary approached the man who was deftly palming cards around a small trestle table. Only a fiver to play, or perhaps a gentleman of your standing could chance a little more. A wink accompanied the challenge. For the first time in an age, the foreign secretary felt for his wallet. Francesca Lamont of the London Cocktail Consortium had worked countless formal functions, but had never seen as much attention given to the canapes. She stood with the waiting staff in the kitchens of the Houses of Parliament as the chef read from a menu. The smoked salmon mousse is gluten-free, but does contain de riz. The baguettine with parfait and orange confit is dairy-free, but does contain nuts. On short-notice secondment to the Restaurant Guild, Francesca was aware of their eccentricities. Even so, every conceivable dietary peccadillo seemed to be accounted for. The choux raspberry craquant has extra low acidity and is suitable for those with stomach ulcers. The brochette de beef sirois teriyaki has been recommended as ideal for anyone with the iron deficiency or an insulin surplus. The king prawn in filo pastry with sweet and sour sauce has been known to alleviate a tertiary lymphoma of the thyroid, but only in pregnant albinos. With instructions clear as crystal, but meaningful as mud, Agent Lamont went to change into her uniform for the evening. Apart from a long corridors of power and country lanes cradling a hunting rifle, the Foreign Secretary did not do a whole lot of walking. A pedestrian subway, for example, was very much a departure. Got anything for a cup of tea? The Foreign Secretary stood over the man as he lay against the tiles, swathed from the cold in dark blankets of grimy colours. He felt the weight of the newly acquired roll of banknotes in his jacket pocket. Young fellow, if you'd care to join me, a cup of tea sounds like a marvellous idea.